Welcome back to Believe in Colts. I'm Lawrence Owen. With me as usual is my guy Gerard Powers. Gerard, how have you been this past week, man? Been good, man. Uh, you know, with the, the weather changing, I had a little, uh, I guess, uh, allergy uh, mishap over the weekend where lips was burning, eyes was red, uh, the whole non-sneezing and all that. But other than that, you know, life is good, man. I can't complain. How about yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I've had some issues here and there. Uh, not so bad that I can't handle it. Um, again, what helps is when you get news, you know, that that is is positive. And it depends upon how you look at the Indianapolis Colts couple signings that they had, whether, you know, how you look at that or not. Mm -hmm. um, but. We'll get into that in just a moment, but I just want to let everyone know that Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info and odds. Find the latest sports developments, including the start of the Major League Baseball season, along with, you know, everything, your odds on just about anything when it comes to sports. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite casino games and poker games it's easy to use to get started today so just you know simply join uh learn why everyone is saying bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on popular sports and games bet online where the game starts so the big wave of free agency is over we had some trades um most of your big names are gone uh you know there's a few still out there on free agency now there's been some news but not with the indianapolis colts right like like the tyreek hill trade um <laughs> we was talking earlier the debo samuel situation uh but the colts did sign two guys um in the past week both safeties one one, I believe, is going to be in the rotational for the starters. That's my thought. The other one, mm -hmm. special teamer. I look at this as an eye-opening on, on both these signings on the whole George Odom gone. Mm -hmm. I see both of these as you just had to go get two guys to fill what George Odom does with one roster spot. Okay. Yeah. See, I think I look at it a, a little different, just a okay. little bit. Um, uh, with the signing of oh man, I forget his uh Armani. With the signing of mm -hmm. Armani, for sure, special teams guy, uh, core special teams guy. That's what he's. That's what he do. That's what um he's kind of known for so far in his his career path journey. But it, like you said, adds adds depth to that room. Uh, Cause you want, you want depth. You want guys that's, that's able to play the safety position as well. Uh, but with Rodney, I think his situation a little different. Yeah. He can play special teams, but we really brought him in to secure that safety. Uh, I guess that safety play. Yeah. We got two starters, but we're bringing in a guy with over a hundred starts. We're bringing in a guy that's been on some top defenses when he was with the Rams uh and then going you know to philly to sign that major deal that he got with philly that five-year deal or whatnot won a super bowl we got an accomplished safety that's already been proven uh he's not trying to make a team through special teams he's literally in there to play so he, I, i'm pretty sure that he'll probably be the one that's up for that starting role or competing for that starting role and if he don't obviously everybody knows with the on defense there's so many um different positions to where dbs get to play that he's going to have a vital role on that defense you don't bring a guy in like that with over 100 starts and all these accolades to just play you know a, a, a big time role on special teams even though he's giving you depth i think he's brought in to kind of challenge that starting role a little bit yeah i i, I do believe that you know it, i don't think he's going to be a starter i think you're right though i think he's going to come in there and bring that that challenge during you know training camp and all that and preseason but as you said the Colts do have two starters at safety but mm -hmm. both of them have not yet to prove that they could be on the field you know consistently 
you know, due to injuries and things right. of that nature, you know, and McLeod doesn't have that major drop off, you know, at the safety position. Plus, obviously, you don't want your guys out there 100 percent of the defensive snaps, even if they do play all, all year. Right. You, you've got to have a guy who can come in and, and breathe other guys and then not have that drop off. So I'm, I'm cool with with the McLeod signing. I'm just. I'm looking because I thought Odom did something very similar as well. I thought he played safety pretty decent when he was, you know, when he came in to to fill in for injuries or or just to to give a guy a breather or something of that nature. But then again, all he also did the special team stuff as well. Right. And that that to me, the value of Odom was above and beyond just a special teams player, you know. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, Odom, hell of a special teams player, and like you said, a, a good piece to that room to fill in and and keep the ball going or keep the machine going when he does get in to play safety. Um, the 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 I guess the difference that I'm I'm saying with the Rodney McLeod and the Odom situation is Rodney is not necessarily known as the bell cow special teamer that's not what he's been doing his whole career so that's what i mean by what he's going to bring to the room is going to be more so of shoring up those starting roles whether he is a starter or whether he's playing another role within that system i don't think that he's going to be that main special teams guy like odom did i think the other signing is gonna you're gonna see him as that bell cow that's on every special teams making plays, you know, being that guy because that's what he does. I don't I just don't see Rodney being Odom for the Colts, if that makes sense. I, I just just where he's at career wise, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, guys of his stature, of his accolade and all that type of thing, like, you know, you're either a special teams guy coming up that earn a starting role or you're a starter you know in the league when you come in and you you play all these vital roles and you don't kind of take your Mm -hmm. career down to say that i'm gonna stay in the league by playing special teams if that makes sense and i think the other signing is what kind of sure sure up that odom role is uh we got a guy that we're gonna bring in that's gonna be our main bell cow special teams hopefully it works out that way and he can add depth to our safety room i think rodney is more so of the leadership standpoint you know we got a uh we got a veteran guy in the room now you know on top of what we already got and he can help mold these two young guys that we have at the uh starting roles and whatever they can't do we we're for sure rodney can replace that so i know that there are two different players Mm-hmm. Um, I get that the two different, complete different people. And I'm not talking about, uh, these two guys. I want to talk about McLeod this year and Sean or, 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 uh, what was his name? Sean. Oh, the other safety that we got last year from uh, the no. Steelers. Uh, you know, my mom's <laughs> bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Give me a moment. Uh, uh, oh my goodness. My brain just Sean Davis. Yes. Uh, okay. the Colts, the Colts had Sean Davis last year, but he didn't, didn't last. Right. right. He, he got into the season, ended up, uh, gone by, by week four. Uh, but he was brought in very similar situation. You know, a, a guy who's had a lot of, uh, starting spots and things of that nature. What's the difference between a guy like Sean Davis, who had a lot of experience, mm-hmm. and you know, and then McLeod, who also has the experience? So I think it's I think it's a similar situation. I think it's a a, a low risk, high reward, you know, type situation. You know, when you get guys of these statues that coming in on one year deals, if it don't work out, you can just wash your hands with it and the machine keeps going per se. Um, and, and, and that's what I think the situation with Rodney is. I don't think that he's one that's just, you know, going to come to the coach and they're letting him know like, Hey, th- this is what we envision as your role, uh, for this season. Like, yeah, we know you can compete for this, but we want you to, you know, be the five on kickoff and be this on punt return and all that. I, d- I just don't see that conversation happening with this type of player, uh, especially when you're talking about a guy that. You know, every year he's been in the league so far, he's had a, a big role within the defense, whether it's a starter or a, 
a, a main reserve role or whatever the case may be. So if it don't work out with Rodney, I can easily see the coach down the road, possibly just washing their hands with and just keeping the ball going. But uh, if it does work out, that's the, the high reward type. You know, we sign a guy. I, I'm not sure what his deal was, but maybe one year vet minimum, maybe a little bit over. I'm not I'm not sure. I don't want to, you know, say numbers or whatnot, but it's going to be something to where they're not, you know, cap struck you know, with this signing or, or whatever the case may be. So I think it's one of those like low, low risk, high reward type situations. And you just hope that what he, the, I guess, attributes or the things that he bring as a player fits and molds well with the coach are trying to do that. That's what that, that I know a couple pods ago, we were talking about how as a GM, you want to just add the puzzle pieces until it all fits and, we, we we got the right pieces in place. And I think this is another one of those puzzle pieces to where if it fits, it's going to fit and work out great. If it don't fit, hey, we can just throw this one out, look for another one uh, of the same Ram or, or the same uh, type player. Yeah, yeah. And and right now uh, with free agency going on, there's so many, you know, things like, like I said earlier, uh, people are just looking all over the NFL for anything, whether it's depth, because I mean, you got, you, you got to get up to 90 guys on your right. roster. Right. And yep. um, now obviously you're going to have, you know, depending upon the team, mm -hmm. five to 12 guys that are rookies plus your UDFAs and things of that. So, I mean, you don't have to get to 90 right now, but you, you should probably, you know, keep, keep, keep looking, keep adding as you go with free agency. I'm curious. I've been wanting to talk to talk to you about this for a while as a player. That's currently a free agent going back in time when, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the Colts were like, Hey, go out, see, you know, and you had to, you know, go through that whole situation. What's it like for a player during free agency like to uh make contact with teams and and, right. and sell yourself that kind of thing well like uh for one when you get drafted like for instance my situation um when i left the coach so when you get drafted and you're there for four years so i basically played out my contract my four-year deal with the coach uh you know in that last year if the team is trying to bring you back or if the team is kind of you know you know that they're gonna kind of just let you walk off it's not really a conversation that they have to tell you you know it's not like they're gonna sit you down and say hey you know appreciate what you did you know we're gonna just let you walk out to the wolves and you know good luck you know uh some teams will give you the proper respect to where they'll sit you down and let you know their thought process and why it's not working or why it's gonna work or whatever the case may be so uh when chuck pagano got in and we had our end of the year uh kind of meetings to kind of discuss some things we kind of talked about it he knew the situation he knew uh, i was getting ready to go in free agency he knew i was coming off of uh you know a serious uh toe injury that a lot of dbs retire from um, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of just, just different aspects goes into, uh, you know, if we're going to bring this guy back or not, you know, because if they feel like they can get a healthier guy or a guy that they can upgrade at that position, you know, they got to look out for what's best for the business as well. So it's just one of those situations as a player, you got to take the personal stuff out of it and just think business. So when I was getting ready to go into free agency, uh, my agent, once the days start going, we, we kind of had – uh, some info on what teams is in interested, what the value was, and, and, and everything. And then, boom, soon as free agency hits, I'm talking that 4 p.m. clock hits, boom, your phone is just ringing off the, the – like my phone locked up like within two minutes when 4 p.m. hit. Uh, just because you just don't know what the reaction is going to be. Like I said, your agent talk – like you'll go to the combine, the agent meet with teams to get feedback and all that type of stuff. Um, so my agent kind of had a gist of the teams, uh, certain teams that was interested in, in numbers and, and, and uh, value and, and, and all that type of things. But you don't really know until now you're in the market and they can literally call you. So uh, when I got into the market, B.A. had just got hired in Arizona. Uh, Tom Telesco, who was our player personnel guy with the coach uh, when I was there, he was the head over player personnel. He had just got the GM job uh, with San Diego, which now the LA Rams, which I mean, no, 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 I'm sorry. 
with the uh, yeah, San Diego Chargers. Uh, I called them the LA Rams. I apologize about that. <laughs> but yeah, so he goes to the the Chargers. So um, you know, I had all these teams calling, trying to get me on a flight ASAP, trying to get me to their facilities and all that type of stuff. Because normally, if you get on a flight and you go to a facility, uh, they're not going to let you leave that building until a deal is done. Because they're not they're, they're not flying you out just to fly you out. You know, they're flying you out. You're basically being recruited all over again like you're in high school they're flying you out you're staying at the best hotels you're going to go out to dinner with the coaches um all those type things while your agent and representatives is talking numbers with the team and uh my situation was i was supposed to go to san diego uh tom i the first phone call i answered was tom telesco and uh, i know tom was mad at me for a couple years we made up though i uh, had some conversations so I was going to go to San Diego and in my mind, I was going to sign with San Diego, the numbers and everything that they had, I was okay with, um, you know, then it's the West coast, sunny weather. I just got into golf and I was just like, this is the perfect start of my golf career. And then BA calls and BA calls. And he's like, I'm not letting you go to damn San Diego, cancel that flight. You're coming to Arizona, come to Arizona. So I actually listened to him and, and called San Diego was like, Hey, I'm going to take this flight um from arizona y'all just book my flight from arizona to san diego so when i leave arizona i will fly to san diego to meet with you guys i didn't know again i'm young i didn't know about if you go to a facility they were basically going to lock the doors and you know until a deal is done <laughs> you know at the end of the day so you know we're in arizona and uh, of course i know ba uh from uh him being the interim coach you know when he was with the coach and we go through that whole situation so we're in arizona and i loved everything about it man and you know, and when they we drove the numbers up to where they kind of matched what San Diego was uh, offering, and uh, we got the deal done, and and uh, that's kind of like free agency is wild, man. Everybody, as a player, that's like the one thing that I I, I believe every player should should go through. Like, um, I know everybody once you get drafted to a certain team, you want to stay with that team because there's not too many people can say like. I, I got drafted by the coach and I played 15 years and I retired as a coach. You know, there's not too many people that can say that, which is a hell of an accomplishment. But free agency kind of puts the ball back in your court as a player. Because once you get drafted, it's just like, I didn't choose to get drafted by the coach. The coach drafted me. You know, it's just like you don't have any cho choices, you know, when you get drafted. But when the ball is in your court, and you've learned what you learned the past four years, just being a professional and learning the business and all those things. I mean, it's just a fun experience because it, it, it feels good to be wanted. So it feels good to be recruited and, uh, and all those things because sometimes players can be dehumanized as, um, you know, in some people's eyes. You know, people just look at the players as just products on the field and nothing else as if they're not human beings and nothing like that. So when people are calling you and recruiting you and, trying to do those things. It just makes you feel good as a player. So um, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a true believer that every player should at least, before their career is over with, just go through that free agency process because it's, it's something that you will talk about for the rest of your life because it's wild how the business works and the cutthroat stuff that goes on to get players and, you know, all that type of stuff. It's, it's kind of crazy. So I don't know what your experience was coming out of high school, but was it kind of similar, kind of a, a throwback to that situation coming out of high school into college? Yeah, it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. You know, you go in high school. I know me growing up, I, I didn't dream of playing in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, I knew I wanted to play football, but, you know, back then coming up, it looked so far away, mm -hmm. like so hard to achieve that it was just like, I know I'm not good enough. Like, I'm this small 5'10 corner from – you know, small town in Alabama. I'm not the fastest, not the quickest. You know, I'm just good at football. But, you know, you go through your high school career and then all of a sudden, you know, this coach sees you and then this college sees you and then these people are coming to your school to see you. And, you know, Nebraska is bringing their private jet to their school just so you can talk to the coach. Just all these different things start to happen as a player. It boosts your confidence up. Mm -hmm. It makes you believe in yourself even more. Like, oh, man, like if these – billion dollar institutions are flying all the way to see me play like I, I gotta have the ultimate confidence if they believe mm -hmm. in me you know so you go back to that to being able to choose what school you want to go to again ball is in your court you know being able to choose whatever uh, school you want to go to it kind of reminds you of that and you lose that when once you get to college 
and you realize like the college game is a business just like the NFL mm -hmm. business, you know, you're only good as what you've done for me lately. You know, you're either going to, you know, excel on the college ranks or just be a guy nobody noticed or be a guy don't nobody notice at all. You know, that's basically how the college game go. And um, once you make your name, you know, in college and then all of a sudden you can get drafted. Once you go through the free agency process in the NFL, it takes you back to like, oh, man, these people really believe in me. Like, oh, I have been doing a good job these past <laughs> four years, even though when I was with the coach, this is not me personally, just give an example, but even though that, that team that drafted me every week, that coach was telling me I was doing this wrong and this wrong and I can't do this and I can't do that. But then you go to free agency and you're like, well, damn, all these other teams say that I, I'm a great tackler. That a great <laughs> you know, so it just makes you feel good as a, as an athlete, as a person. Awesome. Uh, a lot of, okay. So during free agency, uh, it's pretty, uh, um, well known about mm -hmm. Chris Ballard and his, his team building philosophy, right? Yeah. He, he likes to build through the draft, get his own guys, but he does go and use free agency, whether in trades or pick up a couple guys here and there, but you don't hear much, uh, reporting about whether or not you know, he's out there getting in contact with players and their agents. You, you hardly hear much at all. How much, if you know, how much contact from teams and GMs to players and their agents happen that's not reported at all? Oh, is it like the majority? Yeah, none of that stuff is report. Like you won't, you won't find like a GM uh like calling agents or calling players that's what the scout got i mean it's so many people within the building that's yeah uh, all that stuff to where like even though chris probably has his list of people like he does his due di diligence obviously um he he knows exactly who he wants who he probably can't get who he has a good shot at getting like he's just not waking up and and saying like hey i wonder if such and such would love to be a coach today he has a plan and everything execute but teams have people in place that kind of talk to the agents and do all that those type of things the gm's gonna have talks with the agents when it gets serious but far as the day-to-day -day stuff uh i don't i don't see chris really i guess trying to stay on top of what each person is doing like the guys that he's want of course he's probably for sure in contact with those representatives and uh, making sure he keeping tabs on certain guys, certain players, but you don't want too much stuff to leak from your building anyway, because it kind of gives other people heads up on what you're thinking and what you're doing and, and those type things. I know we don't like the Patriots and how they do things, but you know, you don't necessarily hear things that's coming out of the Patriots building or things that's coming out of the Titans or whatever the case may be, because everything, everything you do inside your building, you want to kind of keep it inside. Um, uh, you don't kind of want to be that that one team or everybody knows the moves you're doing or whatever you're making. You just want the, the world to know when it becomes official, uh, if that makes sense. But I'm pretty sure Chris got a group of players that he has in mind that fits exactly what he wants uh, or exactly how he wants them to fit within the coach system and everything that he's probably keeping a tab on and talking to agents and making sure he's up to date with what's going on with their status. Because if it's somebody that he loves or wants and he ends up signing somewhere else or whatnot, of course, he's going to want to know that so he can replace that guy with somebody else that he's like, like the next tier guy or whatever the case may be. So uh, you won't, you're not going to hear much stuff about who's talking to who when it comes to free agents and agents and GMs and all that type of stuff. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like you, you get on social media and stuff and you, you hear Colts see a lot of Colts fans sitting there saying, well, Ballard ain't even talk, uh, Ballard and his team, you <laughs> know, even ain't even talking to nobody. He's just trying to build it, build up his cap space. Like it's his personal bank account, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And I, I just, I don't see that. I, I see that as, the Colts organization are keeping a tight lid on things. I'm sure the organization is contacting players and, and, and stuff. lots of players probably, you know, and their, and, and, and their agents and stuff and, and, and keeping tab, maybe even making offers or, or uh, Hey, can you come in for a workout or something like yeah. that? You know, there's probably workouts that don't even get reported, you know, yeah, and, and, and there's people working out every Tuesday, every Monday or Tuesday, there's a group of free, even during the season, every Monday and Tuesday, there's a group of free agents for every team that's working out, trying out, because they, they have to keep an eye on everything. 
Like they gotta, they gotta make sure they can, they can find a diamond in a rough or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. It's just them trying to stay sharp to, to, to find something that can be upgraded within their, their team. But what I think, I think a lot of GMs today is just in a different space. It's a different football game right now when it comes to the business side of things. Like the past three, four years, the, the teams that's been winning the Super Bowls has been teams that's going out and spending money free agency wise, getting guys that they that are proven and guys that they know what they're doing. I think with the coach situation, Chris is trying to adapt to that to where, yeah, we got to have the cap space ready in case we're able to sign one of these big name guys that we think is, that, that is going to fit. But in that same token, other pieces we can still build this thing to, through the draft as well it's mm -hmm. just always a piece or two that you might have to pay to go out and get that d that d lineman or go out and get a matt ryan or whatever the case may be everything else can still be built through the draft and i think sometimes as fans uh we kind of forget that we just think that if we don't sign all these big names oh we're just trying to build through the draft build through the draft well the reason why you want to have cat space is because if one of those big names come up that you like that fits this team, you got to have enough money to get these guys. These guys are not cheap. Everybody else, rookies and all that, you, you know, they're like I said, they don't have a choice. Once we draft who we draft, you're stuck with that contract until it's up. So that's how you're able to do that. And I think he's just trying to work his way to make sure, again, if he didn't have the team numbers and cap space and all this stuff right, when Matt Ryan became available, we wouldn't have been able to get Matt, you know? So I think yeah. it's just one of those things that he's trying to maneuver in this new era to where teams are going out and getting guys that fit and that they know that can play right now. And he's got to have his money situation and everything right. Because like I said, you look at uh, James Bradbury corner, you know, he's not going to just sign for vet minimum. You know, you look at um, Tyron Matthew, he's not a vet minimum guy. You look at, um, uh, Stephon Gilmore, that's not a vet minimum guy. And these all guys are still free agents, you know? So mm -hmm. you just never know what free agent out there that, you know, you got a tab on to where if we sign this guy, we're going to have to pay him a little bit of money. He's just not going to come in to pay for, you know, some chump change. That's like, <laughs> I mean, serious, that, that, that's funny. It's like bringing in, uh, like, well, say you have, uh, you're, if you're Chris Ballard, you got like two and a half billion dollars uh, left on your cap space and, and you bring in, you know, Matt Ryan and you work him out and everything's great. And he's like, all right, how about this contract? Do you like this contract? Oh, I love this contract. Great. I need to free up 12 million. Won't you sit here for a couple hours <laughs> yeah. while like, or a couple days? Cause I got to go yeah. call a couple guys real quick so we can renegotiate and get, get, you right. know, adjust their contracts. Cause they got to come back they got to come up here and sign. Right. You know, to make sure exactly. That and that's what I'm saying. Know? So, so <laughs> just like you say that, that, that example right there, that situation. So, Hey, Matt Ryan, sit still for a second. I'm gonna call mm -hmm. you back in a couple of days. Let me adjust some things. So now you're going to, you're going to your guys that do the dirty work, the guys that mean the most to the team, the guys that's not making as much money. Now you might have to cut this guy or that guy that meant everything to your team just to sign this other guy. So that's why I'll be telling fans like, man, you just got to be patient. These guys know what they're doing. It's a reason why he's a GM. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. <laughs> exactly, man. And, and on top of that, you, you got to, it's not just the business side of thing. I mean, it is business, but at the same time, like as a, uh, you need your upper management of personnel. Uh, yes, you don't have to be light, but it, you got to have some kind of respect of the players. Otherwise, there's no point, yeah, you know. Sure. So, so uh, you 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 got to run things a, a certain way and um, be upfront. I think being upfront is very very important with players because let's face it, if you treat players that's on your team badly, it ain't going to take long for that to get out. Yeah, and because I mean you as a player you got friends you know that are on other teams and then it's going to get spread you know it's going to be that whole telephone call situation and the whole nfl will right. know this gm sucks don't come to this I team mean, i mean look at jacksonville <laughs> look at jacksonville and urban meyer that whole situation i mean people knew from the start when urban was hired that it was about to be a a, a mess over there and then within weeks this report comes out, that report comes out, and then players are speaking out. 
you know, and all those type things. And you don't want that in your organization because, like you said, it just gives you a bad look to where mm -hmm. if you're a free agent, it's like, why in the hell would I go there and be miserable just like such and such just said he was miserable or, or whatever the case may be. So you want to run your organization to a point to where players understand it's a business. That's like I said, players got to get out of the personal stuff when it comes to NFL and, and business. Like, once you make the 53-man roster, you can take everything personal for those 17-week season. But soon as that season is over with, you got to get back in a business mind. Like, you're your own corporation at the end of the day. You're your own business. So players in business with anything, you know, whether it's sports, whether it's um, real-world business, whatever the case may be, you just want honesty. Whether it's good or bad, you would rather just have somebody being straight up honest with you because – it lets you know how you can deal with it. Like you would rather somebody to tell you the truth so you can hit that problem head on rather than, you know, you sitting in a GM office and they're talking about how much they love you and how much they want you back and they're going to resign you and make sure your agent phone is ready, man. We're going to get a deal done. And then two weeks later, you don't hear nothing from them and nothing and they go sign somebody else to take your spot. You know, and that that's the part that where I think in the in the NFL business, it can get so cutthroat because guys are lied to all the freaking time. You know, people are lied to. And then when the truth comes out and a player responds, however he responds, that's why I always look at it like, man, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have believed him in the first place. Like, <laughs> of course, he's going to try to find somebody else if he thinks that he's better than you. I mean, it's a business at the end of the day. And I had to learn that as a player. You know, I used to take stuff personal to the point to where it was like every team I was on, I felt like, you know, it was a, the same love that I loved them. They loved me back. That's that's just how you grow up playing sports, you know, team ball, you know, uh, and all those things. So it took me a little while to understand, like, man, like you just better go out there and do your job and do your job the best that you can possibly do it. If you win, great. If you lose, that sucks. But if you lose and you did your job great, that means nobody's blaming you for that, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, because that's kind of how you got to look at it as a player. Like you can go 16 and 0, 17 and 0, 18, whatever, however many games we're playing now in the NFL, go 17 and 0. But if you play bad all year, they're still going to cut you. You win a Super Bowl, they're still going to let you go. So that's what I mean by players got to realize, like, you have a job to do and a responsibility to do. And that's the one thing that matters the most, because if you do your job at a high level the way that you're supposed to do, the next guy, he's able to do his job at a high level. So and that and that's what I think a lot of times fans get misconstrued, because from a fan perspective, it's we love the team. Like, hey, I love Indiana. I love Indianapolis. I love the Colts. Like, I want my team to do great. They don't necessarily look at it far as a, from an individual standpoint. Well, you talk about, you know, it's free agency. It's a business. Um, sometimes with free agency, especially with the young guys, um, when you realize that, you know, there's a possibility of losing someone and you want to keep them, Obviously, right. there's that extension, right? You you talk, the, the team talks to the player and they're like, hey, this is your final year of your contract. Let's let's try to get an extension so we don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that during that free agency period. And then teams end up making offers, obviously, right? right. Uh, there's a situation, there's a few situations that's happened uh, so far this offseason. Um, you go look at Kyler Murray earlier this year, right? Mm -hmm. Uh completely took all of the Arizona Cardinals off his social media just this past week. Same thing happened Debo. with uh, Debo, right? Um, yeah. Bring us through that that situation a little bit on, on what's going on there and why players actually do that. See, I think when you when you're at, when you play a position like quarterback, for instance, when you play that that type of position, Kyler Murray, uh, you know you have influence. You know you have a little bit of power. Even if it's a little bit, you know you have power to kind of, I guess, write your own narrative, uh, if that makes sense. And uh, and I think with Kyler, he saw a couple guys getting paid, you know, from his draft class or whatever the case may be, and he, he just wants to be paid. And I'm pretty sure when he took those pictures down in the Cardinals, saw that and then now it's in the media now the fans are thinking that he don't wants to be there so you see how that narrative changed like so quick mm -hmm. um they have to save faith because with every team every team in the nfl if your fan base is not supporting your team you don't have a team 
you know, yeah. at the end of the day. Like, you know, if your fans are not behind you, you're not supporting. So you don't want your fan base to be against, you know, the team. And I think Kyler kind of changed that narrative to where now, like, the fans are like, oh, he don't want to be here. He's unhappy. Like, what are we doing? Steve Kahn, Michael Bitwell. Like, we need to do – like, you can just hear all that going. And I'm pretty sure they had some type of conversation, some type of talk to where we're going to get a deal done before training camp. We're going to get a deal done in the summer or whatever the case may be because those pictures popped right back up and now mm -hmm. everything seemed to be fine. The situation with Debo, I feel like because it came out of nowhere, because you look at the success uh, the 49ers had mm -hmm. last season and you look at the success that he had as far as his value, yeah, he don't play quarterback, but he played about three or four positions on that <laughs> offense to where they, if you take him off that field, they can't do what they do without him. And I think he understands that he kind of – controls the narrative a little bit and he wants to get paid you know I think he might be going into the last year of his deal you know and wants to get paid and I'm pretty sure at some point this summer some point training camp you know those though he'll he'll follow the 49ers back and everything will be great because they're not letting Debo Samuel walk out of that building I think when you're a young player sometimes you're still learning the business and like you said you might see other people getting paid um, especially when you see other people getting paid that's not value like your value. You know, that really a, a, a tick you off. Uh, but what probably made Debo mad is they, they might have offered Debo a deal. And normally that first deal they offer you, that first extension, it's a, it's a low ball one. You know, I mean, it's business. Like, why would they offer you the best of the best deal that they can possibly offer you on the first offer, you know? So I'm pretty sure – it was a low ball offer and he got pissed off, like pissed off to the point. He was like, what? Like, oh, they playing with me. Like, let me go unfollow them right quick. But what can he do? He has to show up to training camp. If not, he's going to get fine. Like, he's under contract right now oh, at yeah. the end of the day. But I think him doing that lets them know he's serious about getting an extension. And I'm pretty sure he'll get one. You don't – I mean, if they offered him the money, like they give him a contract and you know you're 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 thinking in your head extension i'm uh, minimum minimum you know the 10 mil plus right and you look at it and go seriously you want to pay me six million dollars a year you know what the hell i do you know and at that point i think the team knows that he was upset because as soon as he saw the numbers i'm sure he was like that's exactly you know, <laughs> but see, this is, a, this is the flip side of it that I think that some players don't realize. I didn't realize it, but sometimes being patient and waiting, the money's just going to get higher and higher. Look at Lamar Jackson right now. Mm -hmm. If Lamar Jackson was adamant about getting the deal done last year, this year, whatever the case may be, the Ravens would have done it. They love Lamar. Like, they love everything about Lamar, what he brings to the table, everything. They just got a report came out that Lamar said he don't even want to discuss it or talk about it until after the season. And he's going into the fifth year of his deal. And he knows Lamar. I mean, he knows that Deshaun Watson just signed for the most money ever. He knows like all these quarterbacks is getting 35 million a year, 40 million, whatever the case may be. They're getting all this money. So when he does get a deal, who you think is going to be the highest paid quarterback in the league when he signs? Lamar Jackson. You yeah. know, so if he would have signed before Deshaun, you know, Deshaun would have beat him. So there, there are some benefits to the waiting game as well. But the I guess the other side of that is when you play quarterback and you know you're the franchise guy, you know you're not going anywhere. But when you're a cornerback, when you're a linebacker, or when you're this, oh, they can they can replace you ASAP. So you'll see those guys kind of force the ball a little bit to try to get their money just because they know they play a position that's easily replaced. You like you. You can find other good cornerbacks, not not everywhere. I mean, every team needs good cornerbacks, but it's certain positions that you play that they're like, all right, if he walks, cool. We can get another guy to do what he does. But when it comes to quarterback, can't just find a quarterback. You know, Joe Blow just can't be signed on the street and come in and do the same thing Lamar Jackson does or whoever your franchise guy is. So the quarterbacks, they're, they're a little divas when it comes to – to, to how they approach their stuff just because they know that they got the team by the balls at the end of the day because you're not going to find another one, you know? Yeah, it's, it's the difference between Dak Prescott holding out and saying, I need yeah. money, I need money, even though I had an ankle injury and didn't even play last year, I still want money anyhow. <laughs> still got, got paid, got still it. got paid. 
And there's a difference between that and Stephon Gilmore going, I want money, I want money, and then the Patriots going, really? All right, we'll trade you for a fifth-round pick. <laughs> exactly. uh, <laughs> same thing with Revis. Like, uh -huh. Revis like, huh? Like, nah, that's all right. You'll go, we'll get another one. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it sucks, you know, because everybody, everybody's human. Everybody's a player. Everybody's out there putting their – they're 110% on the field, right? I mean, and yeah. But at the same time, the quarterback touches the ball that yeah. much, right? Yeah. And it, it is what it is. It sucks for, for, for a lot. J.C. Jackson gets 11 mm -hmm. picks, like 10 picks, however many picks he had last year. And I don't even think the Patriots offered him an extension, you know? Yeah, I think I think they already knew he's he's going to turn us down. We can't we ain't, yeah. we, ain't, we ain't paying him that much. There's no way, you know. Um, but then again, how much how much cap space did they really have after spending as Not much true. money as they did last year? You know, uh, how, much, how much cap space does the Rams have? I don't know how they have cap space <laughs> or the Chiefs. You or know, Chiefs, yeah. I mean, where did the now see like. When you have a situation like Tom Brady come in and he's like, "Oh, I'm going to bring these guys in. They're all going to be one million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. You know, they're yeah. just going to come in to play <laughs> with me for a million bucks a year. You know, yeah. that that's that's a different situation as compared to like the Rams, who were like, we're going to go get this guy and pay him X amount of dollars, then this guy and pay him X amount of dollars. And I'm like, how in the world this is this is going to bite the. That's point. what. Yeah, at some point they're 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 pushing those contracts back, and at some point the Rams are going to look at their 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 roster and their cap space and go probably in the next two or three years and look at that and go, oh, we're a hundred million in the hole, you know, <laughs> the way the Saints were, you know, last right. year, beginning right. of the year, you know, and that's why I kind of like the way Ballard is doing things because he's always, you know, he's not pushing contracts back. So the, the way he, uh, everybody else is, and he's, he's trying to keep it straight because, you know, you don't want to put, you, you want to build long-term. It's not just for right now. Some Definitely. teams are building for right now. He's building long-term. And if he pushes things back, that's going to put the team in a bad situation later on in, in, in the, uh, you know, next few no, years. For sure. I agree. I agree. All right. We've been running this for about 40 minutes now. Um, actually got a lot more in than I thought we was going to with almost <laughs> no very much stuff going on as of late uh, for, for the Indianapolis Colts anyhow, other than those two safety signings, um, which wasn't a no thing. I mean, yeah, both both guys are going to definitely get some touches sure. uh, uh, respectively on their positions, most likely. Yeah. I mean, I like both signers. I like both signers. I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, I mean, it just shores up that room. You you can't have enough good DBs at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, so definitely. You got DBs that can, like, play multiple positions, play special mm -hmm. teams and all that. Like, you cannot have enough good DBs. So is there anything else you want to bring up uh, before we end up closing this out for th this episode? Nah, I know. Uh, I know we got the draft coming up soon. That that I guess our first pick is in the second round. Uh, I know yeah. we don't have a first round pick. You think we go wide receiver, or do you think we go offensive lineman? Ooh, I think we trade back and grab another third or fourth round pick, and then use okay. that one. Okay, uh, you know, for uh, like probably. I I I think it's it depends. I think they go be with Ballard. I think it's BPA. I think he'll he'll lean towards using that BPA on a on a position of need, but still BPA. You know, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. And, and I, honestly, um, at this point, I can't argue with his philosophy on how he does it. You know, right. it's like Jonathan Taylor. You know, we did uh, not true. need a running back at that point, let alone move up in the draft, trade oh, wow. up in the draft to get him. That's a hell you of know? a pick, I tell you that. And, and yet, and yet, no one's <laughs> arguing with him right now about that, right? <laughs> hey, man, that was a hell of a pick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let the guy use his, his strength job. and yep. do do what he does. I will not argue at all. I mean, because you know, Darius Leonard was the worst pick in NFL history in the draft. So right. you know, <laughs> Ballard don't know what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Keep getting these greats. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I, 
I, I do want to say real quick, though, it's not just Ballard. It is his team, team. as yeah, well. Team. You know, his yep. he's got a great group of people, of scouts and stuff. And and you know, let's not forget about Ed Dodds and all them other guys, you know. No, for sure. And I know we're about to head out, but a lot of fans, the fans that's listening, the scouts, like their word goes a long way in the building. Those are the people that the GMs, player personnel, uh, directors and all that, they're depending on the scouts to bring them information and they're going off of what the scouts say and then they'll go do their own research. So the scouting the scouting guys with, on every team plays a vital role. I'm talking vital role. They have to learn the defense that the team runs, they have to learn the offensive systems the team run, and they have to go out there and search for guys that fits within the system. They're just not looking at guys to see if they're fast, if they're long, if they do all this stuff. They're looking for guys that literally fit the system. And it's hard, like, because, I mean, who's to say a guy comes in and, you know, he's 0 for 10 on the guys that he's brought in, that the 50 sit like, these guys' jobs are on the line. So you got to think that everybody's doing the best that they possibly can to bring in the best guys to fit what we do as a coat, as a coat. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And plus the, the amount of work these guys put in, Man, you think, right. well, they're sitting behind the desk and, and, and uh, no, these guys are probably out. I, I can't, Saturday, they're at games. Like, yeah, football yeah. they're at the college games on Saturdays. Yep. They drive in there. Yep, driving, traveling. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, Ursay ain't loaning his personal jet no, out to the they, freaking scouts. And then on Monday, <laughs> they have to be in the, the, uh, they have to be in the staff meeting on Monday giving a mm -hmm. report on guys that they just went to go see. They giving a report on to Chris Ballard and whoever else is in that room saying like, hey, yeah, we went to go see Gerard Powers today. He did this. He can do this. I don't like this. I like that or whatever. And then it's up to Chris to decide, yes, I like him or nah, I will go with the next guy. That's how it's done. Like they're going to bring up and give you every pro and con and then they have to explain why is Gerard a good fit for what we do? Like, they have to tell the GM that. It ain't the GM is just looking at notes or whatever. They have to sit up there and vouch for a guy. So that's why I'm saying the scouts do a hard job. The scouts has a hard job as well. What about pro scouts? Do they go to the games on Sundays? Like, I'm, around uh, the league or something? I'm, or I'm not sure if i ever seen uh, pro scouts from any other team at our game, but I'm pretty sure it's some way, it's somehow they're they're doing what they're doing. I'm not sure about that one, though. I'm that's, that's, about research. Yeah, research. that's that's something I've always wondered, because, I mean, you, you want to see the stuff, what's going on, you know, in real life in front of you, because, I mean, that's why Combine is there, right? That's that's right. why you have guys come in and, 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 and do, you know, test runs and stuff like that, because you know, tape is tape, but you still want to see it, you know, live in front of your face too. So yep. that's why I, I think there's got to be a way pro scouts go out and see these guys in action um, beforehand. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. they got all their reports from when they were in college still, but they're yeah. not this most likely they're not the same person at by that yeah. point. Yeah, you know, I'm not, even I'm not if, sure how they go. I'm gonna have to do my research. I'm gonna have to call some people to see exactly what the pro scouts do. All right. I'm, so the next pod, we're going to talk about that next pod. That sounds like an <laughs> idea. Maybe maybe we could get one on here. I, that'd be awesome. That would be good. Uh, that would be awesome. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Believe in Colts. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, if you did enjoy it, make sure you download it. Um, if you're listening to this on the audio podcast, go check out the video version over on YouTube on the Lawrence Owen channel. And... Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, go check it out uh, on the audio podcast over on Believe Podcast Networks uh, slash Believe in Colts. And until next time, I'm Lawrence Owen. Uh, that's Gerard Powers. And as usual, go Colts. Go Colts.